and um, introduce Helen Fink, who is here with us this evening for our monthly speaker series. Um, Helen is going to be sharing her um, book, um, and as her screen here shows, this is brought to us um, by New Hampshire Humanities, which does a great job of um, finding really wonderful people and information and stories out there. So Helen, I'll let you say a few words about yourself and introduce your topic. And thank you for being here this evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. I always enjoy this and I enjoy it when I can do it in, in person too. Um, so this is the, the uh, cover photo of my book, Oil, Ice and Bone, Arctic Whaler Nathaniel Ransom. And this is a, from a painting that shows a pretty accurate uh, capture of a bowhead whale, which is what I'm going to be talking about this evening. I like to tell people when I begin that this is a family story. Excuse me for a minute, Leah. I keep seeing the participants in my side screen. Is everybody else seeing that or are they gone? It depends on what your little view is. So people can choose if you want to choose um, speaker. I don't believe, did that change anything for you? I think it's an individual setting, but. Oh, somehow you got muted as well. You're still muted. Still muted. Helen. And this is as a, as we said yesterday, that even though we've been doing these for, um, you know, Zoom meetings for the last year and a half, I'm clicking to ask to unmute for you, Helen, and see, there we go. Okay, good. I think we're back in business. Excuse the, the uh, conundrums here. All right, let's get started in a better order. Um, so as I like to tell people, this is a family story. On the left is my grandmother, and um, she lived with me when I was a child. She taught all of her four grandchildren how to read and write, and she said nothing about her father, who's pictured on the right. All that I knew about him was that his photo hung in the family parlor and that he was my grandmother's father. I learned by accident that he was one, he was the sixth of seven brothers, and that every one of these seven brothers became a whale man. I had assumed that he was an only child. So Nathaniel Ransom grew up in the little town of Mattapoisett. This is about nine miles east of New Bedford. And when he was growing up there in the 1850s, it was a town of about 1,700 people. You can see from this old map that it has a very good harbor. And in Mattapoisett between 1740 and 1870, about 400 ships were built. And many of those were actually whaling vessels. Whaling was the most significant New England industry. In fact, it was the fourth largest industry in the United States. Of course, the United States was much smaller then. Um, and the peak of whaling was in the 1840s. By the time Nathaniel Ransom entered the whaling business in 1860, it was already on the decline. Most people think about whaling in terms of sperm whaling, like the famous story of Moby Dick. And in fact, that's not where we're going. We're going into the Arctic uh, after bowhead whales, so a different kind of whaling. This protection paper that was written for Nathaniel Ransom functioned as a kind of passport and it entitled him to the protection of American consul in foreign ports. What interested me about this document is it shows that he went to sea at the age of 14. He was an American seaman aged 14. He was a child and he was small for his age. He was five feet, one and a half inches tall, not very tall. By the time he grew to adulthood, he was only about five feet seven. Today, none of us would send a 14 year old boy to sea for three or four years aboard a whaling vessel where his only way to communicate with parents or people at home was by writing letters. And an exchange of letters between Massachusetts and the Arctic could take as long as six months to a year. So he set sail in 1860 in a whaling vessel very much like this one. 
This is the Charles W. Morgan, and it's the only surviving wooden whaling ship left. It belongs to Mystic Seaport, and in the summer of 2014, it made a voyage north and came to Boston, where I had the wonderful treat of seeing it myself. Nathaniel Ransom knew this ship. He went aboard the ship to visit friends of his who worked on the ship, and it's exactly like the ships that he served on, on his four whaling voyages between 1860 and 1875. These wooden whaling ships were about 100 to 120 feet long, and the center mast was about as tall as the ship was long. So imagine that center mast is 100 feet tall, and Nathaniel Ransom, this agile, young 14-year-old boy, had to scramble all the way to the top of the mast in the rigging to furl and unfurl the sails. As a common seaman, he lived below decks near the prow of the vessel with about 20 to two dozen other men in a dark, damp, and often vermin-infested area below decks. The Charles W. Morgan sails, if they were all laid flat on the ground, would cover about two-thirds of an acre. Life aboard whaling ships was really hard. The food consisted of barrels of salt pork or salt beef cooked together with potatoes. Potatoes were the most common uh, staple aboard whaling vessels. There were onions and there was hard bread and very little by way of fresh food or vegetables. Nathaniel Ransom was a good fisherman and whenever the ship was near shore, he would fish for albacore and skipjack tuna and also for mackerel, cod or any other fish just to have something fresh to eat. On the Charles W. Morgan hanging over the side here, you can see the wooden whale boats and those would not have been over the side of the vessel except when it was actively whaling. Otherwise, they probably would have been lying face down on the deck. These whaling vessels, in addition to their stores of food, carried as much as five cord of firewood. So those of us who have wood heat have a good idea of how much a cord of wood is. So imagine five cord of wood stored in the vessel. And they also took aboard live animals, cattle, sheep, hogs, ducks, and chickens to provide a source of fresh meat wherever they could, could, and then in port wherever possible, they took on as much as they could carry of coffee, beans, rice, onions, and anything else that was available to eat. Nathaniel Ransom's first voyage set sail in the spring of 1860 and traveled first west, then south, then around the Cape of Good Hope, at the tip of Alaska, excuse me, at the tip of Africa, and then sailed toward Antarctica in the South Indian Ocean, then around New Zealand and Australia, back and forth, back and forth. The captain was first hunting sperm whales. So the kind of whales in Moby Dick were the most valuable catch because they gave the purest whale oil and also the spermaceti, this very odd waxy mass in the head of the sperm whale produced candles that gave an exceptionally clear white light. Sperm whaling was about played out by this time and Nathaniel Ransom only ever participated in the capture of four sperm whales. After about a year at sea, the captain of his ship decided to head north into the Arctic. And this would be the prime whaling ground where he would work for the next of his whaling voyages. They traveled usually past or through the Hawaiian Islands and then northward, you can see a line through the Aleutian Islands here. And the, the Aleutian Islands are about 70 degrees north uh, latitude. The line that goes up through there is marked 72 passage, which is what the whalemen called it. It's actually 172 degrees west longitude, and that was the best passage through the Aleutian Islands. The whalemen traveled north this way, usually in the month of May and June, and there was still so much ice coming down toward and even through the Bering Strait that the whale ships made their way cautiously along the coast of Siberia 
and attempted to pass through the Bering Strait and then northward up into the Chukchi Sea. The prey that they were after was the bowhead whale. And this is an, uh, a modern day image of the head of a bowhead whale, very different from the way that you picture sperm whales. So bowhead whales, when Ransom was hunting them were 60 to 70 feet long and they weighed about a ton per foot. They swim in water about 32 degrees, and for insulation, they have the thickest blubber of any whale. So blubber as much as a foot or 20 inches thick, and more blubber meant more whale oil. Hanging out of the whale's mouth, that odd flexible um, stringy pieces that you see, that is baleen. So baleen whales include blue whales, humpbacks, right whales and Pacific gray whales and the bowhead whales. These whales have no teeth. They feed by opening their mouth and taking in gallons of ocean water and then closing their mouth to expel the water. These strips of baleen fold backward into the throat of the whale and act like a sieve or a strainer that strains out the krill or plankton that is the whale's food. The baleen was immensely valuable. This is a strip that belongs to me, uh, immensely proud of it. This strip is about eight feet long. Back in the whaling days, the strips of baleen hanging from the whale's upper jaw would have been as long as twice as long as this, so 14 to 16 feet long. The left end of this strip of baleen, where it's thick and rounded, would have been the part of the baleen embedded in the upper jaw of the bowhead whale. And there could be as many as 500 of these strips hanging from the whale's upper jaw. It tapers toward the right, as you can see, and then very oddly, you see hair hanging down from it. When I do this presentation in person, I bring my baleen so that people can touch it and see it. The baleen itself is made of keratin. So keratin is what your fingernails are made of and horses hoofs. The uh, end that is growing out of the whale's jaw is stiff. It's about uh, almost a quarter inch thick. And keratin and baleen are flexible and springy. You can bend it a little and it will spring back into shape. That meant that in the days before plastics and spring steel, it could be used for buggy springs. It could be used for the visors of men's caps, the stiffening in collars and shirt cuffs, and a host of other uses. The hair that you see hanging down there feels exactly like a horse's mane, so kind of coarse. And it could be used to make paintbrushes, but also to stuff seat cushions, buggy seats, or anywhere else where mattresses where you needed something um, hair-like and relatively fine. The greatest use of baleen was in women's fashion. So on, on the left is a picture of umbrellas. Baleen was used to make the ribs of umbrellas and the handles. And on the right, you see the Iceman's adjustable hip corset. Iceman's corset because it came from baleen whales. It came from the uh, Northern Pacific. And these corsets, imagine um, Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind, and the corset ribs, what we would call today the bones, are actually made of baleen. So women's fashion was the most enduring use of um, baleen, and that meant that it was both valuable, but it was also subject to the way that fashion changed. In addition to corsets, baleen was used to make those circular hoops that you think of in hoop skirts. So Mary Todd Lincoln, those very wide circular skirts were uh, shaped underneath by a petticoat made with hoops of baleen that could be split and bent into shape and steamed so that it could be formed into those um, kind of hoop skirts that were called crinolines. This photo shows the processing of taking off the whale's blubber. So this is the bowhead whale in the Arctic, and you see men cutting off that thick blubber, maybe as thick as 20 inches, very much in the way that this would have happened on a whale ship. 
men cut it off with sharp spades and peeled it off around the circumference of the whale, pulled it away from the whale's body by a hook, a block and tackle, and then pulled it onto the ship to be cut up in further pieces. Um, in the left corner of this photograph, what you're looking at there are the blades of baleen, uh, probably the, the whale's head is upside down, the upper jaw resting on the ground so that the baleen is stiff um, and coming out and the feathery nature shows you really what the, the hair of it is like. So the baleen was brought aboard ship and then processed in the triworks. This, um, uh, hearth-like brick structure. This is actually a photo from the Charles W. Morgan. So this is a stove-like structure. In the bottom of the brick structure are fire doors. You put the fuel there first, the wood that was kept aboard whale ships is used to heat the fire. And then in the top of this brick structure are inset huge cast iron cauldrons. 200, 250 gallon capacity. And into those, the pieces of blubber were forked and then heated from the fire underneath until the blubber melted and released its oil. When that happened, the pieces of whale skin that had given up all their oil were forked down underneath, thrust into those doors so that the fuel was kept going by the whale skin. Imagine how that smelled. Imagine that fishy smell of burning whale skin and imagine the greasy, greasy smoke that came from whale ships. When the whale oil had uh, been rendered up from the whale's blubber, it was ladled into the tank that you can see there at the left and then eventually run down below decks into casks that were kept in the hold of the ship. The bowhead whales could make as much as 100 barrels of oil from a single whale, and 100 barrels of oil would be about 3,000 gallons. Remember that whale oil was the best source of lighting and also of lubrication. New Bedford had a huge textile industry, Wamsutta Mills, and looms had to be lubricated with oil, preferably with whale oil, and that made it very valuable. After spending the summer months in the Arctic hunting bowhead whales, the whalemen in the fall, usually in October, traveled south to Honolulu or Hilo in what was then the Sandwich Islands, today, of course, Hawaii, but then not part of the United States. In this photograph, you can see whale ships at, uh, at docked in Honolulu, and the ships would stay here usually through the month of November into early December. It was a chance for whalemen to get those letters from home, and it was a chance to restock the ship with provisions to buy cattle, to buy um, bananas. That was Nathaniel Ransom's experience in the fall of 1861. His first trip to Honolulu brought off bananas, so brought bananas onto the ship, and bananas were a brand new thing in the 1860s, and brought off bananas and ladies, he said. So prostitution was a huge business in the Hawaiian ports in those years, and the women were sometimes allowed to come on board ship because it was easier for the captain to chase them off the ship than it would have been to allow the whalemen to go ashore and spend their days and nights in, uh, in um, harbor in Honolulu and then to try to run, round up his crew. Crewmen very often abandoned ship. Hawaii was a choice place to leave the ship, but the conditions aboard whaling ships were bad enough so that men left or jumped ship not only in Hawaii, but in the Arctic, off the coast of South America and almost any place the ship put into port. Then in uh, early December or so, the whalemen headed south for what they called the between seasons cruise. Between the Arctic seasons, in the months of December through March, it was far too cold to be whaling in the Arctic. So the whaling vessels headed south along the coast of California and Mexico, looking for humpback whales, but also looking for Pacific gray whales. And that's what you're seeing here. These Pacific gray whales were perhaps 40 feet long, so way smaller than bowheads. Their oil was less choice 
and their baleen was only about 14 to 16 inches long. So far uh, less profitable prey than the bowhead whales. But Pacific gray whales migrate just as the whalemen did. So along this map, you can see that in the winter months, they would have headed south along the coast of California and Mexico. And then come the months, the Pacific gray whales, like the whalemen themselves, traveled back north uh, up through the Bering Strait, between the Aleutian Islands first, up through the Bering Strait and into the Chukchi Sea. So the whalemen chased these Pacific gray whales in the winter months and then returned to Hawaii, the Sandwich Islands again in the early spring and then back into the Arctic. The whaling vessels would spend three or four years between uh, the Sandwich Islands and the Arctic going back and forth north to south whaling before they came home. So Nathaniel Ransom's first voyage lasted from the spring of 1860 to the spring of 1864. And remember that this is the Civil War years. So in the spring of 1864, he comes back to Mattapoisett. And this is a painting of what Mattapoisett Harbor would have looked like around 1870. He spent one more term going to school. So remember that he had to leave school at 14 when public schooling ended. He went cod fishing on the Grand Banks. That was a profitable venture. And then in early uh, 1865, for some reason, he was at the siege of Mobile, Alabama in the Civil War. And I've been unable to verify his military history, but I do know that two of his brothers enlisted in the Union Navy and worked on steam powered gunboats in the Gulf of Mexico. A third brother joined the Massachusetts Colored Infantry Volunteers. During the Civil War, some Confederate raiding vessels went after whaling ships and other whaling ships that were past their useful lifetime were purposely sunk by the Union in the harbors of Charleston and uh, in the harbor of Charleston and other uh, locations going to escape me for the moment. But in any case, um, twice, uh, huge numbers of whaling ships were purposely sunk to block these southern harbors. That meant that the size of the whaling fleet was reduced considerably by 1865 when the Civil War ended. Nathaniel Ransom then spent about a year and a half on land, and then he went back again in the fall of 1865 aboard a ship called the Sea Breeze. And this time he was promoted from his initial rank as seaman to become a harpooner. This is a, a photo of the statue of the harpooner outside the New Bedford Whaling Museum. So the whaling vessels that Nathaniel Ransom served on uh, left port in New Bedford in the fall. And uh, once again, he traveled the same familiar route. He was headed toward the um, Cape Horn, the tip of South America, and then hoped to make his way up to Hawaii and then up into the Arctic. But bad luck struck the sea breeze shortly after it left port. Typhoid fever was apparently caused by dirty water in the uh, barrels, in the water barrels below decks. And the crew came down with typhoid fever. The crew became too ill to work the ship and the captain had to put into Port Stanley, a fairly remote and desolate place. And they stayed in the Falkland Islands for three months. Nathaniel Ransom recovered pretty quickly and took care of the other people, but it was a long spell of idleness that was completely unprofitable. The ship's second mate and fourth mate died in Port Stanley and the crew suffered illness enough to leave some of them fairly weak. Nathaniel Ransom was one who hated idleness. So he really chafed at being in port and he was very anxious to get off to the whaling grounds. 
In fact, the first stop was Honolulu again. He and a friend of his were so happy to finally be on land and in the tropics that they rented horses. They went fast riding on the beach. They got themselves arrested and thrown in jail and fined 25 cents. The captain figured out where they were, bailed them out, and set sail for the Sea of Okhotsk. Nathaniel Ransom called it simply the Okhotsk Sea. Notice that in this slide, we can still see the Aleutian Islands coming down from Alaska toward the Kam Kamchatka Peninsula. So the Aleutian Islands fought of forming the southern um, reaches of where bowhead whales are found. The Sea of Okhotsk is further south than the Bering Sea or the Chukchi Sea. And that meant the whaling season could begin here earlier in the spring and last a little later into the fall. The Sea of Okhotsk was actually pretty crowded with whale ships and whaling had begun here earlier than in the Bering Sea and the Chukchi Sea. So the whales were somewhat shy and they were younger and smaller than further north in the Arctic. Nevertheless, the sea breeze made three fairly successful summer voyages here. The difficulties were that the ship lost all, almost all of its crew. First of all, uh, of, the, of the initial crew, 14 men left the ship. So in Hawaii, relatively benign place, off the coast of Chile, but even in the Arctic, men ran away from the ship because the conditions aboard the whaling vessels were so poor. Also, during the three summers that he spent here in the Sea of Okhotsk, one man fell from the rigging, think of that main mast 100 feet high, fell from the rigging, landed on deck and died three days later. A harpooner, like Nathaniel Ransom himself, got entangled in the rope attached to the whale and fell overboard. Nathaniel wrote, we never saw the poor fellow again. And another man fell overboard from a different whale boat. So of the original crew who signed on with the vessel in New Bedford, only four men of that original crew were left when the sea breeze returned to New Bedford and Nathaniel Ransom was one of them. So he was incredibly persistent and uh, really could endure hardship. Um, this is a voyage for which I have actual data on how much money he made. So the way that whalemen were paid was sort of a fractional system and an incentive system. A third the proceeds of the voyage went to the ship's owners. A third paid the cost of the voyage, outfitting the ship, tolls or uh, taxes in foreign ports, wharfage and so forth. And a third went to the captain and crew allotted by rank. The captain obviously got the largest share, then the first mate, the second mate, and down to the lowly seamen. Nathaniel Ransom earned a fractional share of whale oil and a fractional sale share of the whalebone captured in his three years on board minus the amount that he owed to the ship. So notice how much he paid out from his earnings for things that he needed during the voyage. So his net pay $1,227 for three years and six weeks. For purposes of comparison, it's useful to know that a Civil War private would have made about $13 per month in the Union Army. So this was at least somewhat more lucrative. He returned to New, Bed to New Bedford and made his way home to Mattapoisett in June of 1869. Remember that he set sail in the fall of 1864. And he came home and about um, 17 days after he arrived back in Metapoisid, he got married. So this is my grandmother's uh, parents' wedding certificate. Nathaniel Ransom on the right, and on the left, his wife, whose name was Sarah Dexter. And she was the girl next door. He had gotten engaged to her when he came home in 1864. And then they spent four years engaged and away from each other. So first he got engaged, then he was away for four years. Then they got married in a very private ceremony with just the minister present. And then they spent four 
months together. So Sarah was an only child. Her brothers, two brothers and one sister had died in early childhood. And so Nathaniel and Sarah began housekeeping with her parents. And then four months after they got married, Nathaniel left her once again and set out on his third whaling voyage. In order for him to be able to set up a household or had children, he needed to earn money. And it looked like the best opportunity to do that would be to set sail once again. And this time he set sail on a ship called the John Wells. He was promoted to third mate. So the rank, the way promotion worked was seaman, harpooner, third mate. And that's the highest rank that he ever achieved. He never rose to become uh, of a higher rank or captain. This time then we're in 1869, the fall of 1869, when he set sail for the third time. And this time as the whaling vessels made their way northward and were waiting for the ice to clear from the Bering Strait, they went hunting for walrus. This was a new thing during this time period for two reasons. The rifles that were developed in the Civil War turned out to be very practical for killing walrus. Walrus did not react to the sound of the gun. They reacted only if they caught the scent of man. So they drift along on these cakes of ice in the Arctic Ocean and the whalemen could come close to them with a whale boat, shoot the walrus and then butcher them, take the blubber and the tusks, load that into the whale boat and carry the blubber from as many as seven or so walrus back to the mothership. This was much safer than going after bowhead whales and it was a profitable way to spend those months when it was too early to go after bowheads because the ice was still too thick. The walrus uh, have about the same range. They live in the same area as the bowhead whales. This was actually a terrible form of slaughter because the walrus were very often simply wounded and fell into the ocean and were not captured at all the walrus could make about three quarters of a barrel of oil. And of course the tusks were also valuable. It's interesting that both female and male walrus have tusks. So beyond the number of walrus that the whalemen actually captured and butchered for uh, oil and for tusks, there were literally thousands more who were killed and lost. And the walrus, as it turned out, were a very important um, food source for the Chukchi natives of Siberia and the Inupiat people in Alaska. Daylight lasted 24 hours in the Arctic in the summertime, of course. And so they went walrusing, hunting and shooting walrus all, all 24 hour uh, days. On, in one single day, Nathaniel Ransom's ship slaughtered and captured 75 walrus. So a very uh, um, successful hunt for the whalemen, on the other hand, devastating as we'll find out for the native people. The weapon, the, the rifle uh, turned out to be ideal also for shooting bowheads. So the weapon that was being used now was called a bomb lamp. And it fired a bomb that exploded in the body of the bowhead whale upon impact. Then the um, bomb was attached. So this is a lance that carries the bomb that penetrates the hide of the bowhead and explodes in his body. At the same time, the lance carries the rope that makes fast to the whale. This was far safer and easier than approaching a whale close enough to harpoon him. So the whale boat could kill the whale from a greater distance. And this made it even more profitable to hunt bowheads than it had been in the days of needing to harpoon them, which was actually far more dangerous. In the summer of 1870 then, Nathaniel Ransom's ship, the John Wells captured 11 bowheads and he shot four of them. It turned out that Nathaniel Ransom was a crack shot. That was one of his most valuable skills. And um, in, in October of 1870 then, so fairly late, early October, the John Wells turned south, heading back 
uh, toward Hawaii as the other vessels all did. And there was a terrible storm that blew up. Uh, I think hurricane is not quite the proper term uh, in the Arctic, but a very powerful wind and snow and rainstorm. And one of the whaling ships, a ship called the Japan was lost. And the rest of the whaling vessels, after three days of deadly, horrible weather and damage to their ships, the, the remaining part of the whale fleet made it back southward. Nathaniel Ransom's ship this time did not go back to the Hawaiian Islands, didn't go back to the Sandwich Islands. Instead, they traveled around these tiny little South Pacific Islands that you see here. Today, some of these islands, particularly Kiribati, and uh, Vanuatu are in danger of being completely wiped out by sea level rise. And the island of Nauru, uh, which is north and east of uh, New Guinea actually, is a place that uh, Australia has been using as a detention camp for migrants who are trying to enter Australia. Nathaniel Ransom then and his crew traveled around among these tiny islands looking for humpback whales and with very little success. Nathaniel Ransom bought a parrot. He traded to get some shells for Sarah to take back to her. And he sold his accordion to the king of this island called Ponape. And uh, the king of this island was called Nanagan. He was famous for wearing a stovepipe hat like Abraham Lincoln would have worn and a man's white shirt and very little else. And I was interested that Nathaniel Ransom sold his accordion to him because I had no idea that my great grandfather was at all uh, musically inclined. In any case, as spring came on, the John Wells turned back toward the Arctic. And this time they saw a very odd sight. So Nathaniel Ransom and his crewmates saw a canoe appear that they took to be full of native people at first. The men were very gaunt, they looked filthy, they were bearded, they were wearing skins, furs, and it turned out that this was in fact the remnants of the crew of the ship called Japan that had been lost in that terrible October storm in 1870. Captain Frederick Barker said that he had been able to save 15 of his crew and they were taken in by the Chukchi people of Siberia. And what's significant about this story is that the Chukchi people had no food to share except walrus blubber. Some of it already putrid, some of it still attached to the skin and the hair of the walrus. And Captain Frederick Barker told the crews of the whaling fleet that were um, back in the Arctic in the early summer of 1871, that it was three days before he could bring himself to eat any of the walrus blubber. When he did, he realized how the native people themselves were starving because of the whalemen shooting the walrus. And he pleaded with the crew of the whaling fleet to stop killing wal walrus. He sent letters to the newspapers in Honolulu and New Bedford, and it did no good whatsoever. The native people continued to starve from the decimation of walrus herds caused by the whaling fleet. Frederick Barker and the uh, surviving crew members of the Japan went to work whaling among the Northern fleet uh, and helped, helped to sort of earn their keep in that way. They had spent the months from October to May without seeing any other people who could speak English or any other people who were familiar with the culture that they came from. And they were in a very poor physical condition and obviously traumatized by the months they had spent in cold, near starvation and almost complete isolation. Nathaniel Ransom learned in May or June of 1871 that his youngest brother, Andrew, had followed him into the Arctic. Like Nathaniel, Andrew became a whaleman at the age of 14. By now he was 20 years old, making his third voyage, and he was the harpooner on a ship called the Progress. 
he had become sick and the captain had sent him back below decks, so demoted him. Nathaniel was finally able to go and visit, visit Andrew, take him some warm boots and mittens that he had bought from the Siberian people. And Andrew brought him letters from their parents and from Nathaniel's darling wife, Sarah. He always referred to her as his darling wife. The progress and six other ships remained south along the coast of Alaska while Nathaniel Ransom's ship and 33, 33 in total, so Nathaniel Ransom's ship and 32 others traveled further north. So the brothers saw each other briefly in the Arctic and then parted company. By August 29th, uh, troubles started for the Northern fleet. And it turned out that the ice was pushed uh, by a strong wind from the west and began to push these 33 ships of the Northern fleet toward the coast of Alaska. Here we see one of the ships being wrecked. So the first shipwreck actually happened on September 1st. It was a ship called the Roman and it sank in 48 minutes. The next day, another ship ran aground and was crushed by the ice and auctioned for $13. The speed of this disaster meant that these ships lost their provisions, they lost their oil, they lost their entire cargo, but no men were killed. Here you can see men standing on the ice floes there. Because the ice was thick enough to walk on, the men could simply walk to another whaling vessel and be taken aboard. The crews of whaling ships always helped each other and in order to save lives in the Arctic. But it became clear that the Northern fleet was in very grave danger. This illustration, these uh, illustrations come from Harper's Weekly of 1871, and they come from sketches made by the captain of one of the vessels that was here crushed in the ice. You can see that the ice flows are actually cakes of floating ice. So not the towering icebergs that carve off, calve off of Antarctica, but ice flows. And they pushed these vessels of the Northern Whaling Fleet closer and closer to the coast of Alaska, where the water was so shallow that some of the ships ran aground. It became clear after five of these ships were completely wrecked that the Northern Fleet had no real way to escape. So the captains of these 33 vessels met in the cabin of one of the ships to decide what to do. And they decided that they would have to abandon their ships. It was September. They knew that like Captain Barker, they would have to stay in the Arctic all through the long cold winter. And they knew, particularly Nathaniel Ransom knew, that his ship had very few provisions, too little food, because the ship hadn't returned to the Hawaiian Islands to restock the vessel. So that meant imminent starvation and freezing, a totally impossible situation. The only thing to do was to attempt to reach the ships that were further to the south. Remember that Andrew's ship, the Progress, and six others remained about 70 miles further to the south. This map shows, it, uh, shows where the whaling fleet was lost in that sort of roughly rectangular shape. So today, the, sh the ships, their remains, are found in about eight or nine feet of water. In 1871, there was about 13 feet or so of water there, but not enough to keep the ships afloat. Instead, they needed to make their way south to reach those seven ships that were still in open water. Nathaniel Ransom, because he was the third mate, had a whaleboat assigned to him, and it was part of his task <clears throat> to uh, travel south to reach these seven ships in clear water. And he and the other uh, whalemen who were sent there were first sent with a whaleboat full of provisions, as much as they could carry of salt beef, salt pork, and fresh water, and take as much as they could to these whale ships further south. He actually made two trips, sailing and rowing, together with his crew, usually six men in the whaleboat. 
it was a two day journey. So halfway through, they had to camp on the coast of Alaska and shelter under a whale boat that had been turned on its side to offer a little bit of protection from the wind. They reached the Progress and the captain of the Progress said, tell them all, I'll wait for them as long as I have an anchor left or a spar to carry a sail. The problem was that there were crews of 33 ships who had to make their way 70 miles south to these seven ships and try to get aboard the seven rescue ships. In the end, in the end, all of the crew of the whaling ships to the north were saved. There were 1,219 people who made the journey 70 miles to the south in whale boats. So here you get a better idea of the size of whale boats, usually between 16 and 20 feet long. Each had both a sail and oars, but you can see how seriously overcrowded they are. The whale boats normally carried a crew of six. And then we also see how incredibly choppy the sea is, the wind is strong, the vessels in the background are the rescue ships, the progress, you can see the names below, and at least two of them broke an anchor chain and had to really struggle to maintain their position. Nathaniel Ransom on his first journey south had put his belongings aboard the ship called the Lagoda. His brother was aboard the Progress. The ship that he got onto himself was the Europa. And he was one of about 300 people on board the Europa, which normally carried about 30 people. Nonetheless, all of these ships limping and partly destroyed made their way south and reached the Sandwich Islands in safety after about five weeks at sea. And there, Nathaniel found eight letters, uh, eight letters, one from my parents, one from Theodore, that was his brother, one from James, another older brother, five from my darling wife. And he also goes to visit with his brother, Andrew. He talks about reading his letters and he says, he had quit reading before he finished them on account of not feeling able to proceed any further. I felt very bad all day. We're in the time before PTSD, before any recognition of real psychological trauma, trauma. but it's evident in reading his journals that whenever he suffered any sort of psychological trauma, it worked itself out in physical symptoms. He was lucky, he was able to survive, he traveled from Honolulu to, San to Oakland, California by steamer and then from San Francisco back to New Bedford by Continental Railroad. Remember that we're in the fall of 1871. The Transcontinental Railroad is only about two years old. The journey across the continental United States took eight days. And along the way, he passed the ruins of the great Chicago fire. So the Chicago fire had killed about 300 people and left about 100,000 people homeless. Nathaniel Ransom saw the ruins of the fire and he probably compared the situation of the Chicago residents to his own situation. He at least, and as far as he knew, his family was well, and he at least had lost no more possessions than those he had to throw overboard in the Arctic Sea. He wrote that he had thrown overboard his clothing, his bomb lance gun, a musket, his ammunition, and quite a lot of other things. What he saved was his journal, and he continued to write in it all the way back until he reached home. He returned home to Mattapoisett once again, and he stayed on land for about three years. This was the longest time span that he had spent on land since he turned 14. He and Sarah settled in a little house near the Mattapoisett Harbor. She gave birth first to my grandmother in 1873, and a couple of years later to another daughter named Eunice. But in the early 1870s, the U.S. experienced a very severe economic recession caused by overspeculation in the railroads. And it became so difficult to find work that Nathaniel Ransom had to undertake 
another, his fourth, his final whaling voyage. And that was aboard a ship called the Illinois. His final voyage went back to California by train, just as he had come home. So the whole whaling business had changed. Ships no longer needed to make that journey around Cape Horn, and they no longer needed to remain at sea for three or four years. Instead, they docked in San Francisco, made the journey to the Arctic, and returned to San Francisco, where whalemen could end after one whaling season. And this, in fact, turned out to be an interesting voyage for Nathaniel Ransom. It was only one summer season in the Arctic. So uh, eight, March of 1875, and then returned in the fall of 1875. He wrote in his journal that he gathered firewood among the wrecks. So he returned to those ships that had been abandoned and crushed in 1871, where he salvaged firewood for the Illinois. The native people had taken anything salvageable from those ships, any metal goods, um, tripods, metal axes, lances, spears, and so forth, also rope and as much wood as they were able to take away. But this was clearly a traumatic experience for him as well. The Illinois made a very successful voyage. They killed, slaughtered more and more walrus and succeeded in making a, a very profitable boy, voyage in terms of baleen and oil. A greasy voyage is what whalemen called a fortunate season when they made good money. He made as much money in one summer season as he had made in three seasons aboard the Sea Breeze. So clearly a far more profitable journey this time. This is the last whaling voyage that he ever made. He made enough so that he never needed to return to sea. A little bit more about whales. This um, uh, harpoon tip here gives us some indication <clears throat> of how long a whale had survived because the, the harpoon was embedded in the bowhead whale back in the 1880s and survived until the bowhead whale was killed in 2007. Har, uh, harpoons and parts were always marked with the name of the vessel and the whale boat so that uh, valuable metal goods could be retrieved. And it was possible to tell from the shape configuration of the harpoon tip that it dated way back to the 1880s. So bowheads could live as long as 130 years, and it's now known that they probably live longer than that. This is a photograph that the National Oceanographic and uh, Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, took in the um, December of 2015. <clears throat> and it shows the remnants of the whale ships. You can see part of a ship's knee to the right and a small anchor and another um, eye bolt there. So remnants of the whaling vessels were still visible. This was an underwater archaeology journey, partly to see what was left of the whale ships because of climate change. The ocean has moved about 20 feet further inland than it, the position where it was in 1871. Uh, Nathaniel Ransom and Sarah, this is a um, picture from a larger home that he earned, uh, that he owned later, had a fairly peaceful life. He worked as a market gardener. He drove people with a horse and buggy where they needed to go. He had two daughters and two sons, all of whom he sent into higher education, perhaps because he himself had had so little. But he died in 1907 of kidney disease and liver disease and heart failure at the age of just 61. I think that the poor living conditions aboard ship probably had a very serious effect on his health. I'm gonna end here with a bowhead skeleton uh, still remaining in Alaska and let you know that bowhead whales, interestingly enough, are not endangered. They are estimated to be about 10,000 left they live a very, very long time. And so far, they are living in Arctic waters where there's not a great deal of ship traffic, nor a great deal of endangerment from fishing gear. So bowhead whales are among the species that are considered the, the least threatened. Okay, 
I, that's the end of my whaling story, a cold and chilly story for a pretty cold New Hampshire night. But I'd be glad to answer any questions if people have any. Thank you very much, Helen. That was that was a lot of a great great story. Get some get some clapping there. Um, yeah, we have we have a, a moment or two, and um, I know that um, as Helen had said that. Um, We'll, we'll have a copy of her book at the Ray Center. Um, there will be one, hopefully, at the um, Osceola Library in Waterville. And um, we'll give one over to Wendy at Bookmonger. So if you're local in Waterville, there will be some access to, to the book. Um, but if anybody would like to unmute themselves for a, a question, um, it looks like we got a comment that Love the presentation. Thank you. And a few people came in. That's good to see. Glad yes. to see it. Indeed. Hi. Thank you very much. Am I You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you read these stories about these these men and the the rigorous life and that they survived, mm -hmm. astounding. What you know? What I found so much so astounding was the courage. It's one thing for us with GPS and with the satellite navigation and all the tools that we have to go somewhere, but these people had so little, um, so little uh, knowledge or so little way of finding out where they were. No way to call for help. Yeah. No way to stay in touch with their family. They wrote letters back home without knowing whether their parents, for example, were still alive. It was a really difficult life. And um, one thing that interested me is that in, in I read probably a couple of dozen whaling journals written by all kinds of different people. Some were very religious. So some believed that if you did not go uh, whale hunting, for example, on the Sabbath, that you would um, survive the voyage. <laughs> and that there isn't really any cause and effect that you could figure out in that way. But um, Nathaniel Ransom, as it turned out, was not particularly religious. He did not indulge in that kind of thinking at all. Um, but I guess he, he started so young. I mean, he did, did so many things. I mean, he, he went so many times. He saw so much history. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It's astounding when you read these adventures, the, these experiences that the men, even before them, and I can't even remember the name of the book, but, you know, the ships that would go out and get caught in the ice, you know, mm -hmm. way up there in the Chukchi. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just, um, it's incredible. I mean, we mm -hmm. could never do that today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One that's Sarah the one of Sarah Dexter's ancestors uh, did get trapped in the ice, and it was a very sad story. It happened right off the coast of Mattapoisett that a whaling uh, ship had, I guess it was a passenger ship, had come in there and gotten trapped. And some men went out in uh, rowboats to try to save or help the people that were trapped in the ice there, and they themselves froze as well. So I had, that's one story my grandmother told. And when I went looking for it, I thought that that's what I was going to find. And then I, uh, first thing I found about Nathaniel Ransom was reading his name in the New York Times. And it was, uh, it named him among the officers and crew who had returned safely from this um, whaling disaster. And of course, when you read his name in the New York Times, you sit up and take notice and think, I really want to find out about this. Right, and it's your family. Yes, yeah. It's a, if, if anyone is interested in whaling history, there's a brand new website simply called whalinghistory.org. And that's a compendium of information from Mystic Seaport, the Whaling Museum in New Bedford, and a number of other institutions. And that's a, a fantastic repository of information. Oh, so wonderful. lots of, lots to find there. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you again so much. Is there anyone else before we say good evening? I think, um, oh, it looks like uh, Stephen Bell. I'm not sure if that's, if that I'm saying the name. A, a personal friend, yes. Excellent, yes. Glad to Reading see the a, book, yeah. A friendly name, yeah. Great. <laughs>
Ah, oh, well, thank you so much, folks, for joining us this evening, and Helen for um, sharing your story and New Hampshire Humanities to go to support us and, and bring you to us. And again, this um, presentation is recorded and um, is um, able to be viewed in on, on um, our website under previous speakers. So, um, Helen, I can send you a link to that as well, although I know that you share the info. So, thank you again, everyone, and have a great evening. Stay warm tonight, wherever stay you are. Stay warm, yes, that's the watchword. Stay warm. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.